this final chapter of what has been a very popular and engaging series of conversations around the topic of gender equality in sport. Shortly, we will hear from media professionals Cleana Foley and Cleana O'Leary to get their perspective on how gender balance is dealt with in the print and broadcast media. Then they will be joined on the panel by Irish international hockey player Nikki Daly and Deirdre Carberry, security strategist and gender advisor, to continue the discussion. And we hope that you will also play your part by submitting questions for our panellists during the session. Uh, but first, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to call on Andrea Bland of FPD Insurance, official sponsor of Team Ireland for Tokyo 2020, to speak about gender balance and the relationship between FPD and Team Ireland. Over to you, Andrea. Thanks, Declan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Bland. I'm one of the marketing managers of FPD Insurance. Um, many thanks to the OFI for inviting me here today uh, to be able to give a few words on the topic of portrayal and gender equality and what it means to us in FPD as sponsors of Team Ireland. We're proud to be part of the athletes journey and to be Team Ireland um, sponsors. It's an exciting time for our customers and for our staff that we get to champion and support the local athletes through their communities and through our nationwide network of offices. It's also an exciting change from talking about insurance on a daily basis as I'm sure most people can appreciate it's not the most exciting thing in the world. Um, but the Olympic Games is arguably the biggest celebration of sport in the world. For two weeks, we get to indulge ourselves in watching the best of the best, battle it out for medals, for personal bests, for hours we can flick through sport to sport, getting a glimpse of history being made over and over and again, and maybe even pick up a new hobby or two as well. As we flick through the channels, we're not focused on gender, ethnicity, religion. You know, we're focused on the athletes and their sporting ability. And to be quite honest, quite often we are very humbled by the ability of these athletes. They're phenomenal human beings and what they put their bodies through and their stories and their journeys to where they've come from and where they are today is absolutely inspiring. The Olympic, the Olympic Games, the medals have equal value. Uh, there is no difference between it, but a medal is won by a man or by a woman. We as spectators are focused on the athletes and we're rooting for them, we're behind them, we're connecting with them and we're resonating with them. As we cheer on Team Ireland, we're not thinking about the gender or the religion or the ethnicity of the athlete. We're watching these individuals put on the Irish jersey and go out and embark on the pinnacle moment of their career that has been backed by thousands of hours of hard work and training. And for that moment, backed by millions in their home nation. When the opportunity came to us to get on board for the current Olympiad, we felt this sponsorship was a perfect fit for FBD. Being a community-based insurer and deep-rooted heritage in local communities nationwide, that's where we've come from. And we were passionate about the fit with the athletes. Every athlete has a story and a community behind them. We loved every individual story from every individual athlete, from every individual discipline. The athletes were raised by these communities and we want to champion and celebrate and support this through platforms that we can offer, such as our media and our marketing mix that we use television, online, web, radio and so on and so forth. The disciplines represented on the Olympic stage and the work carried out by the OFI and individual associate bodies provides a level playing field for all athletes, whether it's boxing, rowing, swimming, cycling, gymnastics, we're getting behind a nation and not just a single gender team. So everyone has their own mountain to climb and no matter who you are or where you come from or what you believe in, each athlete is a superhero in their own field, working as hard as they can, disciplined, dedicated and driven, pushing their bodies to the limit to be the best that they can be and make their communities and their nation and their home proud. Gender for us, isn't even up for consideration. The wonderful thing about becoming Team Ireland sponsors is the inclusivity and the opportunity that we have to work with a wide variety of athletes from a wide variety of communities and backgrounds and help them on their journey to Tokyo. We believe that support drives success. Whatever your success may look like or feel like, working with the OFI and Team Ireland has allowed us to understand and portray cross-section of modern Irish sport. It's diverse, it's driven, and it's a very, very exciting place to be. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to the OFI for having me today, and I will hand you back over to Declan.
Oh, thanks for that. Uh, Andrea, well, uh, next I'd like to call on one of Ireland's top sports journalists. Uh, Clea, Clea Foley taught physical education and English before completing a postgrad in journalism at DCU. She has been a sports journalist for 31 years, 24 of them as a staff writer for independent news and media. And since 2015, as a freelance sports writer and broadcaster, she has covered multiple Olympic Games, summer, winter and Paralympics, and is the founder presenter of Ireland's first women's sports podcast, Off the Bench, which started in December 2015 and is now partnered with the Off the Ball Media Group. Her presentation is entitled Portrayal or Promotion and will address specifically portrayal through the lens of print media. Welcome, Cleana. Thanks so much, uh, Declan, and thanks so much to the OFI for having me. Um, I am going to look at this area, I suppose, for a portrayal from three different angles. Uh, one of them is Olympic history. Uh, one is the language that we use around female athletes and how we can sort of address our own subconscious uh, biases. And then the other one is, I suppose, general gen gender inequality in media coverage and how, if you like, it's not it's not uh, females, but actually Olympic sport really that suffers most from that. Um, I'm gonna start with um, just by showing you a postcard uh, that I got from my brother when I started in journalism 31 years ago. And uh, when you see it, you'll know that it, it, it demonstrates, if you like, uh, the sort of stereotypes that were around women uh, when they did sporting achievements in the past. Um, it, it depicts, um, a, a female reporter pitching a story to a male editor and <clears throat> the story is about uh, an Olympic uh, or a female wheelchair athlete who has scaled Everest um, and uh, his questions of course are uh, you know well where, where you, you've forgotten the important things in this story where is her husband during all of this um, Why why isn't she at home and who's minding her children and so <clears throat> they're the things um, when I started in journalism, you would hear blatant sexism like that uh, in, in stories about women in sport. Um, and it was always really, you know, kind of shocking to see it and hear it. So um, that is not lo no longer the case. We don't hear that sort of really, really blatant sexism around female athletes anymore and what they do. But interestingly enough, in that postcard, uh, the, the reporter pitching the story was a woman, um, mostly actually, the, port, the reporter pitching the story about a female athlete will be a male, and we'll talk about the percentages uh, about. But the, as you can see here, the editor, uh, and it was a features editor, but it could, this could be a, um, a sport editor, he's male, and that persists to this day. They're uh, the great majority of sports editors in the print area, thankfully not in TV and radio, but in the print, most, most sports editors are male. And actually this year for the first time ever, uh, there is an Irish uh, female uh, sports editor and Irish national, and that is Orla McElroy in the Daily Mail. But this has never happened before. So that's a really interesting development, I think. So, um, as I say, I don't think that sort of sexism exists anymore in media coverage, but there is some, some sexism still there. Um, and I think that's what we'll explore today um, and the gender equality thing, if you like. Um, and why is that? And um, it's been really interesting. Deirdre Carpey has talked about this in the last few weeks. Sport historically was a male. Uh, it, it was created by males. And so the Olympic movement was also created by males. And I think it's interesting to look at the history of women in the Olympics, if you like. So Baron de Coubertin, the man who founded the modern Olympics, look what he said about it. An Olympian with females would be impractical, uninteresting, unaesthetic and improper. First females to participate were in 1900 and look at the sports they took part in, largely um, feminized sport but also sport of the middle classes which I think is interesting as well and then look at Avery Brundage he was president of the International Olympic Com Committee from 52 to 72 and in 57 which is just three years before I was born he said that he was against events which were not truly feminine like putting the shot or those two strenuous for most of the opposite sex such as distance runs and um, how extraordinary it is that we've had so much change and we have seen this in the Olympics now that things have changed. For example, there were no females in track and field in the Olympics until 1928. A lot of people find that hard to believe, but that's the case. And when they were introduced, they only had five events. 
And the 800 meter was immediately dropped afterwards, which I think is really interesting. Um, on the basis that, you know, many of the competitors, a lot of them looked exhausted afterwards, but actually it wasn't the in International Olympic Committee who stopped them. It was actually the International Athletics Federation. They decided that 800 meters was too much for, for women. And very interestingly, they seemed to ignore that there were men routinely collapsing after middle distance uh, races and they didn't change the rules to, 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 to that for any existence. So, um, Interesting, again, we associate artistic gymnastics so much with the Olympics. Male, male gymnastics was in, women weren't in until 1952. Women's marathon wasn't introduced until 1984. Um, the first female only sailing events weren't introduced until 1988. Women's modern pentathlon, not until Sydney in 2000. And women's boxing, as we all know, not introduced until London 2012. So uh, things have changed. And also, I think it's worth pointing out that there is an equality on the other side, on the other gender side as well. In other words, there, there is no men's rhythmic gymnastic. There was no men's synchronized swimming. You know, inequality isn't always on the female side. But the great thing now is that the percentage of female athletes in, in Tokyo would be close to 49 percent. And that is, you know, that's what the Olympic movement in 1990, I think it was uh, 1991, they made a rule and said, from now on, everything is going to be equal and we're going to really work on this. So I often ask how diverse in the gender, ethnicity and economic background are the team coaches and all the people who are involved. For example, in the last two Olympics in track and field, only 11% of coaches were female. And I think, again, it's very interesting to look at where inequalities, it's not just in media, but is the media coverage of men and women at the Olympics equal? In my opinion, at the Olympics, yes, it is equal. I think the big inequality with coverage of female sport is actually in team sports. But in the Olympics, it isn't so much. But the problem for a lot of people involved in Olympic sport is that throughout the years, uh, there's a huge disparity in their ability to get their sports into the media compared to what we call the top five. And we'll talk about those later on. So um, there is, inequality though still in the Olympic Games in terms of media and that is in, in terms of the people who cover it. So um, look at this study and um, this is the most recent one actually the Cambridge University one from 2016. Uh, so this thing of you know women were more likely to be described using physical features, age, marital status, aesthetic than men were um, as opposed to sport related adjectives and descriptions and the girls calling them girls as opposed to calling you, they don't call men boys. And this disparity can be down to the fact, as I said, that there are far more men working as a sports journalists than there are women. 90%, it says in that study, um, I'm not convinced of that. I, you know, we'll, we'll hear from Fina O'Leary later. I think broadcasting, there's a much, much more women involved in sports broadcasting than there is in sports writing. Um, and in, But interesting, here's, a, here's an example of it. So for the Tokyo 2020, 21 uh, Olympics, uh, the Olympic Federation of Ireland has got accreditation for 28 written press. Only two of those are women. And those two women are actually a sport specific. They're both covering equestrian events. There are no females covering all sports uh, at the, at, for Tokyo. So again, that just shows that there is an, an uneven distribution there. And I think that is also why we still get the bloopers. We still get the terrible mistakes that people make because let's face it, like everybody else, I'm a journalist, we're as stupid as everybody else when it comes to it and we make mistakes. Um, you would hope we'd never see them. You would hope you never see a tennis player asked anymore, you know, to give us a twirl. You know, you'd hope you'd never see um, uh, John, the comments that John Invermel, Inverdale made um, in the past as well about Marion Bartoli, but it still happens. And here's two examples of it. So in Rio 2016, a Chicago paper, the Chicago Tribune, a very, very reputed paper, uh, described Corey Cogdalundra and she, as that was the lead paragraph on the story. She just won a bronze medal in, in trap shooting and she was described as the wife of Bears linesman Mitch Unrath. And the headline actually said, wife of Bears, Bears Lineman wins a medal. That's how she was described. Um, here's a second example of it. When the Hungarian swimmer, Katinka Hossu won the 400 meters individual medley in a new world record time, remember, the camera settled on her husband and the NBC sportcaster said, there's the man responsible. The great thing nowadays is that when these obvious, you know, sexist remarks are made and demeaning remarks are made. Social media is there to pile on and pile on it does. So um, everybody gets involved. People are asked to answer for their actions. There are apologies and hopefully people don't do it again. But as I said, 
uh, journalists cock up. We make mistakes and we're not perfect. But the key thing is for sports, I think always as well, is if we do it, you, 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 you make us responsible for it. You ask why that happened and, and you, you make sure that it doesn't happen again. But I, I do have some interesting sort of views on this as well. I think, there, I think that one is the classic example of it. For example, Wade Van Niekerk, who's, who won the 400 meters in a new uh, world record time at the Rio Olympics, his coach is Anne Botha, 79-year-old, described very often as a 79-year-old great-grandmother, an amazing coach. If the camera had panned to her after he broke the world record and said, there's the woman responsible, would our reactions have been as dramatic? Is there inequality in how we deal with inequality sometimes? I think that is worth asking. And I think it raises the very interesting question of how do we use language around sport um, and around uh, female athletes or any minorities within sport? So uh, that takes me on, I suppose, if you like, to this whole area of language. Uh, is it okay? Is it okay to describe Anne's Botha as a 79-year-old great-grandmother? You know, I would use that same phrase if it was a 79-year-old uh, great-grandfather, because it's extraordinary that somebody has the energy uh, to be doing, to be coaching somebody to break world records. You know, what's their experience? You know, uh, how do they relate to somebody who's a completely different age than them? There's a load of things to be explored there that I think are fascinating. So for me, I, I, I think you could use that, but it brings me to the one like, what about a uh, mother of two? You know, there's always, you know, complaints, um, and I'm a feminist all my life, there are complaints from people who say, you never, you never say a man of two. You know, if you were talking about an athlete, you never say father of two or father of three, but why do you say uh, a mother of three? Well, here's why. Because for a woman to go through the physiological changes that she does for pregnancy and birth and all of those things that she has to go through and then return to her sport, how does that change her physically? How does that change her mentally? How does she cope? all of that does she come back a better athlete in some ways physically or mentally i noticed michelle we just this week talking um in a new york times piece about how um after having her child she says i may go back to serious golf now because i've realized that you know uh, compared to labor you know that wrist injury that i used to whinge about was nothing so i think these are conversations we need to have i think you know it, you know, don't run away from them. Look at Lizzie Lee, the Olympic, Irish Olympic marathoner. She absolutely embraces the fact that she's a mother. She wears it as a badge of honor. And I think, why not? And why aren't we having these conversations? And maybe we'd be having more of those conversations if more uh, sports writers were women. But it is changing. And, you know, I, I, I really think that virtually all of the men that I worked with, you know, would, would be up for asking those questions, would, would be up for exploring that stuff. And I don't think there's any harm in doing it. The best rule of thumb always, I think, for journalists is, is you ask the athletes themselves. What are they happy with? It's really interesting. I was interviewing uh, somebody about race, an athlete about race recently. And before we started, I asked her how she'd like to be described. And I presume she was going to say uh, a black Irish athlete. And she said a black, uh, a mixed race Irish athlete, which I thought was interesting. So from that's how I described her. Ask the athletes, we should be, as journalists, we have to ask the athletes. Paralympics shows a classic example of this as well. You know, this notion of Channel 4 has always built them the superhumans um, and the word inspiration is constantly used about them. But there is now a pushback from Paralympic athletes and I've worked at the Paralympics and some of them say, no, don't ever use that word inspiration about me. Why are you, why are you using that word? You wouldn't use that about an able-bodied athlete. Um, there's a whole value system being you know, expressed there. So all of language is so important and I think we all need to ask ourselves, what are our unconscious biases? And I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise now. So what it is, is I'm going to ask everybody watching today online just to close your eyes for a minute for me. Okay, so your eyes are now closed. I'm going to ask you to picture in your mind, what, do you, what person do you picture when I say these words? International marathon star. Physiotherapist. Coach. A weightlifter. A rally driver. Okay, back in the room, everybody can open your eyes again. So I think, um, do, do, do we see sometimes that we all have subconscious bias that we have to think about? Um, because if we, if we are to use language properly and carefully around athletes, we have to recognize our own subconscious uh, bias. It's something we in the journalists, ha uh, journalists have to do. But I think also if you're dealing with athletes, if you're working in an NGB or, or a sports par partnership or anything or as a sponsor, 
language matters and we all have to look at it. Um, and, and that brings me to, you know, processes, even, even, you know, practice, customer practice in journalism, you know, so much of it is, you know, comes from that original concept that men set up sport. So, you know, do you notice when you pick up a newspaper or go into a website or, you know, watch something or hear something, the results are always senior men, senior women, junior men, junior women. That's a hierarchy that's been established in the media. Who's challenging that? And if you have to give results in that format, to a media organization. Is that what you're doing on your own website? Is that what you're putting out on your own media? What value systems are you doing when you use that sort of what we call the house style? You know, is it, is it possible for you in your own that you can positively discriminate at times, you know, for the woman or the person with disability or whatever it is that you balance out the coverage within your own coverage of your own websites and that and how you present things? Because there's a message there, you know, if, if women constantly see senior men, senior women, junior men, junior women, you know, the juniors think, well, we're lower than them, and the women think, well, we're lower than men. So there's a value system in that hierarchy, and I think uh, I'm just asking people, if you like, I've had to challenge it, and I think we should all be challenging it. Um, I'll give you a great example. An Irish record was broken in the last week. I went on to a, a, a national governing body's website to look up at the previous records and to see, you know, the distribution of them. Um, it's happened to me before. I had to go all the way down through all of the men's records until I got to the women's. That's the way it's set up. You have to scroll down through every single man's record until you start getting down to the women's records. There should be a separate tab for men, separate tab for women. Again, what does that say to female athletes that we're down here and the men are up there? And it's only small things, but I think it all contributes to those um, to those stereotypes and to you know those value systems and um, if we're trying to get change that then we have to challenge all of that um, so I would say that as a journalist we have to challenge it I think it's changing all the time I read an article last week it was it was about art artists um, one of the artists uh, was you no know, was was called they throughout the piece um, so now we have, um, you know, with gender fluidity, which is going to be increasing in years to come, we're going to be dealing with athletes who, you know, will want us to use different pronouns, um, completely different. We have to adapt to that. And I think sports have to adapt to that. So I suppose my point here is let's look at customer practice. Let's challenge it. We could probably all do better in this whole relation. Um, so that's my feeling on language. And then finally, I suppose, promotion. Like I think portrayal is promotion. And I think sometimes people, um, you know, don't recognize that if you like. Um, is there inequality in, is there gender inequality in sports coverage? Yes, there is, but where is it mostly? I think everybody who's watching it probably knows it's in team sport. It isn't in sports where men and women share the same, uh, you know, the same, same stage, if you like, competing together, swimming, athletics, anything like that. We've had, have you noticed, we've had four months of what I call ceaseless chatter of sport. There's been no live sport. So what we've been getting for the last four months in the media, particularly in written media, is, you know, beautiful, fabulous nostalgia. What has all the nostalgia been about? Pardon my expression, but men with balls male team sport that is what that's what's dominated and this is a problem for olympic sports all of the time as well so commercial media follows the money they follow the crowds they follow the money they they think that's what they should cover most because most people are interested in it so you have the big five dominating sport in ireland in 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 the i suppose in the print media and even on websites as well so men's ga soccer rugby and golf and then race horse racing. They're the big five. It must be deeply frustrating for people who work in other sports that they can't break that barrier or get in a foothold in that. My argument with editors always is a good story is a good story is a good story. The gender of the athlete doesn't matter. The sport doesn't matter. Olympic sport has incredible stories to tell. And the great thing about your sports are that you, your stories haven't been told and they change. There's a cycle that changes them very quickly every four years. You know, so like the story of people like Jack Woolley and Irish Taekwondo are the Irish hockey team and what they did. They're incredible stories. They hadn't been told. I think that's why people bought into it so much. But they also bought into it for another reason, which we might talk about later in the Q&A. So I, I understand how frustrating it is for people um, who are involved in Olympic sport and they can't get more of their sport covered in the mainstream, what I call the mainstream media. One great thing happened 
the internet and mobile phones and technology. And that allows you now to create your own media and loads of sports are doing that. And some of the quality of it is phenomenal. We've, we were at a point now where people are practically running their own TV stations. But I would urge a word of warning about this and it's related to um, you know, getting publicity for your female athletes. If you're only, you know, uh, how do you grow your sport, first of all? If, you, if you're only uh, doing all of your own media yourself, uh, you're only speaking to people who already follow you. You're not reaching a new audience. You can't grow your participation. You can't grow your earning power. Um, so that's important. And secondly, remember the Olympics. Um, as I said, the accreditation for Olympics Games now, right now, is um, mostly based on traditional media, uh, TV, news, some websites, and print. Uh, we're very constricted in what we do. And if you went there as you know, the sports officer for your sport, you would be very constricted. You couldn't broadcast stuff or do things you know, that you could normally do. We have, a, we have a booklet that size of rules that we have to keep to. The Olympic Games are very strict about what they allow people to broadcast and do. So therefore, the people who are going to be working and doing all of the you know, preview stuff a year in advance and everything are, are still the mainstream media. And I think that if you make the mistake of not engaging with them or giving up with them and saying they're not interested in our sport and from now on we are just going to do our own stuff and we'll throw them a bone every now and again, I think that's a terrible mistake. Um, number one, because you, you won't grow your sport, you're existing in an echo chamber, you need to reach new people. Um, you won't, your, your sponsors will still look for, you know, their, their primary focus still is at the moment, it may change. They still want to see is the sport on the mainstream media because that's where they feel the greatest uh, number of viewers are. Um, but also I think it limits the depth of knowledge that journalists have about your sport. And in this case, if we are looking at inequality about, about perhaps female athletes who haven't got the coverage that, that they weren't. Um, you know, you, I feel that don't forget to engage, if you like, with the mainstream media, build relationships. It gives them far better understanding of your athletes. They cover them much better in much better depth with much more nuance um, than they would otherwise. So don't forget about mainstream media, even if you're doing a lot yourself. So just to summarize, I think portrayal is promotion, if you like. We need to recognize and challenge our own subconscious bias. And do you have bias yourselves with at what is a very changing and dynamic media. And maybe you need to think about how you're gonna use them in future. If you want your sport to grow and provide equal opportunities, you would do everything in that systematically and with every tool available. So do you have the same systems in terms of media? Is that how you, do you have a system, a, a systematic approach to your media coverage? And finally, if you want to maximize your sports media coverage and earning potential and make sure that there isn't gender inequality on it, then don't just operate in your own social media echo chamber. Thanks so much for listening. I hope I can answer some questions later on and I'll hand you back to Declan. Well, thanks for that, uh, Clean. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, so many interesting points there and we look forward to uh, further chat in a little while, particularly around uh, language actually and how that can affect um, gender bias in, in portrayal. Okay, uh, moving ahead, and I think we can go ahead now to our next uh, panellist. It's another woman who has had and indeed played a pivotal role in how we consume our sports entertainment for many years. Cleon O'Leary is the Deputy Head of RTE Sport, a role she has filled since 2010. She has worked on every Olympic Games for the organisation over the last two decades, from programme editor in Sydney 2000 to away team leader in Beijing and Rio. Cleona is a strong advocate for social justice. She is Chair of the European Broadcast Union Women in Sport Expert Group, Chair of RTE's 20 by 20 Steering Group, Diversity Champion in RTE, and Chair of Aranala Gale's Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee. Her presentation is entitled The Role of Targets in Escalating Change, and she will also discuss the challenges that come from that internally and externally for media organisations. Over to you, Cleana. Thanks very much, Declan. And um, uh, I see a lot of parallels in what I'll say um, with uh, a lot of the insights that Cleana has shared there as well. I've prepared a short piece where um, I will share with you my views and experience in the area of gender inequality in sport, my belief in the requirement for targets and measurement to expedite change, the importance of public service media in this sphere, and I'll also share with you some of the challenges. Um, addressing gender inequalities and offer some proposals for how we can work together better to address them. Um, I've worked in sport for 23 years and I'll start by saying I don't know anyone who intentionally goes out to create gender inequality in sport. Um, I'll also say I don't know anyone who agrees that any of the following is right or fair. 
that 4% media coverage worldwide is for women's sports, which is UNESCO's figure from 2018, that 0.4% of the world's total sports sponsorship spend is on women's sport, which is a statistic figure from between 2011 and 2013, which will have improved, but from a very low base. And that there's a gender pay gap in some sports federations, that there's major discrepancies in prize money between genders in some sports. A lot of sports federations spend significantly less on marketing in women's sport, and many women, sports women experience difficulties accessing sports facilities because sportsmen are prioritized. Most of those inequalities is, um, are historic with federations, brands, and media favoring one gender over the other. And there's a general public perception and a culture that propagates that one gender is more deserving of people's support than the other, and a vicious cycle continues. It has to be said, and Kiana has mentioned it, um, that inequalities are far more commonplace in team sports worldwide than they are in most Olympic sports. But this is the bleak backdrop to the industry that we're all a part of. It is true to say that outside of sport, the world is not equal either. The World Economic Forum published last year that we are 108 years away from gender equality at the current pace of change. So the question for us within sport is, are we happy that the pace of with this pace of change or do we want to escalate it? The Olympic movement deserves credit for the serious targeted uh, progress that it has made in the area of gender equality over the past number of years. And Sarah mentioned some of those last week. I heard many contributors in these webinars mention over the past three weeks that allyship is really important. In general, women see gender inequality much quicker and clearer than men do. It's natural as they have the lived experience. But if men don't see gender equality as a priority in sport, nothing will change. It is a male-dominated area and largely men have the power to change gender inequality in sport much more than women can. I saw an example of this when I was in Tokyo at the first World Broadcasters meeting for the Olympics in 2018. Yanis Exarsos, the CEO of OBS, which is the Olympic Broadcasting Services, in his opening address, he spoke about the importance of gender equality for the IOC. And then he went on to speak about all the measures that OBS had been taken to create 50-50 in their workforce and senior management team. The fact that he spoke about it with Japanese dignitaries at the top table and to a room dominated by male decision makers in sports media from every corner of the world, and it was live streamed, was extremely powerful and it had a big impact on me. Just like in the Black Lives Matter movement, where one of the asks is for white people and non-black people of color to undertake conscious action and education to combat racism, if we believe in equality and fairness, then we need to educate ourselves on all inequalities and find ways to use our voices and our power to create a level playing field. It is well documented that gender equality policies with targets and regular monitoring are very effective in delivering change. Many of the inequalities have been built up over generations and they're rooted in many of the practices and um, in our culture. So they can be extremely difficult to see and to unpick. I'm a firm believer in the need for targets and regular monitoring and reporting to expedite equality measures. As has, has been mentioned a few times, Olympic sports are far more equal than team sports, but team sports dominate the media worldwide, and we're no different in Ireland. The challenge for media organizations is we are creating content for the biggest possible audience, followers, readers, and listeners. And there is an ingrained tradition in Irish culture of supporting men's team sports, so that's what sells. Most editorial decisions are based on this for the most part. And Associated Press has stated that the lack of diversity in sport media is also a factor. It is an extremely challenging time for media organizations worldwide, leading to cuts to budgets and workforces. So resources to cover more content is difficult and recruitment is not happening. So there are fewer opportunities for women to enter the sports media industry. Striving to have an equal number of women sports journalists, editors, and on-air talent does matter. It should not be the sole responsibility of women to cover women's sport. We don't want that dichotomy. But what we want is more men to cover women's sport and more women to cover and speak about men's sport. The ideal is the same for any successful organization, a gender balanced workforce in front of and behind the screen. There is very much a business case for women's sports coverage, and I'll go into this in a moment. But first, as a public service broadcaster RTE, in RTE, we have a unique position. And even though public service media is also struggling across Europe with intense com com um, competitive financial and political pressures in different countries, we do carry a responsibility to reflect our culture, and we have an important role in helping to shape our culture. 
and define our national identity. And it is part of our remit to reach everyone, reflect all voices and represent all strata of society equally. The European Broadcast Union created a Women in Sport Expert Group, which I chair, and we did a survey of members last year. What we have found from organizations who have implemented targets is when they audit their coverage, they generally see that their women in sports coverage is not as good as they thought. They found targets keep the team focused and push people to come up with creative ways to generate women in sports content. They create a sense of accountability, and when done successfully, an atmosphere of positive rivalry amongst the team. In RTE, we have been consciously um, and actively addressing gender inequality in our coverage since 2013. Every year we have increased our TV sports coverage of women's sport. In 2018, the 2020 campaign was launched and we joined as media partners. So the promise there was we would increase our coverage by 20%, but we had no measurement system and we had no accurate picture of where we stood. So Following on from some discussion around this, our DG, D Forbes, made a commitment that we would strive for 20%. We set up a steering committee to look at what this meant in practical terms. We ran workshops to work out the detail, and so we broke the targets into four pillars. One for content, one for journalists, one for experts, and one for outreach. The first priority, and the most important, was to develop and implement a measurement tool across our output. From there, we set a target of 20% sports content on TV for 2020. We're targeting 20% female experts in TV and radio sport that's across our men's and women's output. We're targeting at least 20% female presenters on TV, radio and news sports programming and an increase in women's sports coverage across our online and sports news output. And this year is about establishing that baseline in online and sports news coverage. And we're also educating ourselves and speaking about gender equality and developing training programs and workshops. It is really progressive. As far as I'm aware, it's the first of its kind for media here. And while many of the public service media organizations in large countries have measurement systems for, various, for diversity, very few small countries like ourselves do. We were helped by our colleagues in Sweden, who are so enlightened in the area of gender equality, they're close to 50-50 in their sports coverage. And a big part of that is that their coverage is not as dominated by team sports. And they told us that their online coverage grew by 100% when they started covering more women's sport because they quickly became known as the place to go for new stories you wouldn't find elsewhere. So as a media organization, federation and a brand, we all know the ethical reasons why we need to invest more in women's sport. But like is evident from Sweden's example, there is a strong business case. Research published by Nielsen in 2018 and RT Insights carried out the same research in Ireland. And we found that women's sport is seen by audiences as much more inspiring and progressive than men's sport, while men's sport are viewed as slightly higher quality, a little bit more competitive and much more money driven. So there are some results in our research versus Nielsen though that are different. We found that Irish people are much more positively disposed towards women's sport and have a much more equal view of sports than came out in the Nielsen research. And that's not unusual in that, like when it comes to the global gender gap report in 2020 from the World Economic Forum, Ireland actually stands in seventh place. Um, the UK are in 21, Australia is 44, and the US are 53. But we're up there with Iceland, Norway, and Finland in our position um, in terms of our, um, our uh, the gender equality in our society. So what are the challenges and what can we do together? Also in the EBU survey, it was really positive that 92% of members stated gender balance sports coverage is important for them. So interestingly in the survey though, most broadcasters gave the same three challenges they experienced trying to increase their women in sports coverage. And we've experienced the same. There's a lack of available footage that's visual for news and TV, a lack of stringers at women's sports offering um, for radio, and a lack of women's sports stories on wires worldwide as well. Increasing women's sports coverage requires resourcing, but budgets are limited. So when you don't have to, you won't prioritize the coverage of women's sport, which costs money and there's limited interest. But part of this is, there's a, um, with the limited interest, part of it is that there's a lack of knowledge because of a lack of information, and there's been low levels of women's sports coverage for generations. So whose responsibility is it to close the gap and invest in women's sport to increase coverage? RTE has set targets as we've have, we see that we have a role here, but so do federations and brands in trying to reduce this inequality. This is why it's really important that we all work together. I list some measures here 
which have worked from my experience, but not all of them will be relevant for all of your sports. To address the media's challenge in getting footage with limited budgets, what some of you have been doing successfully is engaging a camera operator to film content, and some of you also engage stringers through radio and send copy. When engaging reporters and camera people, make sure that they're experienced and your footage is high definition or it won't get used. You can stress the importance of gender equality with your international federation and the need for coverage of your athletes in international competition. Some of you over the years have spoken to your international bodies to get footage cleared for us in RTE, but also as an example, the FAI last year um, got involved. When the away Greece game wasn't being shown, they urged UEFA and RTE urged the EBU to try and find a way, and they did. Um, when you have leverage with any rights that you have, try and tie in your coverage of your women's, uh, of your female athletes as well. And where you can, and a lot of Olympic sports do, host men's and women's events together in the same venue, one followed swiftly by the other so that both can get supported at the venue and um, on TV um, or on radio. And double headers in GA and soccer um, and rugby have worked well here in this. Also, you can identify opportunities where you can share resources better. Um, media br um, brands and federations, for example, last March, um, AIB, Camogie, BBC Northern Ireland and RTE, we all pooled our resources to deliver the club Camogie finals on Clare in HD for the first time ever. Also last December, Swim Ireland and RTE pooled our resources to deliver the European Short Course Swimming Championships. And as a result of all of the pooling of resources, um, the content was visible and available for all media to use. If there is an opportunity to move your competition as well, and you're looking for TV or radio coverage of it, discuss with media stakeholders, because the summer, as you know, is really challenging for airtime. But there are windows throughout the year where access to airtime is more achievable. If you have access to TV and or radio schedule, and you're being advised to move your competition to a later slot, take it. The, the National Athletics Championships audience increased threefold because John Foley and his team there at the time moved the start times to post our live GA coverage. Also, and Kian has mentioned this as well, don't assume all journalists and editors will know what's going on for all of your athletes. Make a few contacts and keep them informed and make your female athletes available before and after competition so we can promote the competition. And this also will also help the audience to get to know your athletes. Consider the titles of your competitions. We're trying to avoid gender marking, where before we would have written on the website, the women's Irish soccer team, we're, we're now saying the Irish soccer team. Um, and you can influence titles of your competitions. For example, if it's the women's World Cup, that's okay, as long as it's the men's World Cup as well. And spend equal amounts or more even on marketing your female athletes. The IOC also produced really good portrayal guidelines, which are worth having a look at. And remember, we have targets to achieve. So the more female athletes you offer to RTE now, the more of a chance your sport might get covered. So the other aspect mentioned by broadcasters is the limited interest from the public. Some of that is perception, as we've seen from survey results, but also this is a vicious cycle. Women can train to their full potential because they are not getting paid or the, or the required resources. The public complain about the quality, less people support them, and so the media doesn't cover it and brands don't invest. In my opinion, all of us working together and creating targets and measurement systems will help to break this cycle. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand you back to Declan now. Well, thanks for that, Clean. There's some, uh, some great insight there. Loads to discuss. And I would like to remind everyone, by the way, uh, that we are interested in your questions. So please do make your uh, contribution in the Q&A. Well, uh, now I'd like to welcome to the discussion two women with unique perspectives on how women are portrayed in sport and in society in general. Nikki Daly is an Irish international hockey player who was part of the historic team that won the World Cup silver in 2018 and qualified Team Ireland for the Tokyo Olympic Games. She also holds a master's in motorsport engineering engineering and comes from a renowned motor racing family. She is a founder of Formula Female, a motorsport initiative that was designed to introduce women and girls to both motor racing as a sport and motorsport as a platform for STEM education. We're also joined by Deirdre Recovery, a security strategist, gender advisor and World Health Innovation Summit expert group chair for gender equality and women's empowerment. She's also a former captain in the Irish Army and as many of you will recall in week two, Deirdre has spoke impressively 
on the topic of leadership. And Nikki, Deirdre, you're very welcome. And uh, if I could ask all the pan panelists at this point to unmute uh, just uh, just now. Nikki, if I could start with you, well, you certainly have a unique insight into three different sports, given that you've won representative honours in both hockey uh, and Gaelic football. And of course, uh, you've got Castrol Orr in your, in your veins from your motorsport involvement. What have you seen in how gender portrayal differs in those sports? Um, yeah, first of all, thanks Declan and thanks to the OFI for having me here today. Uh, it's been really interesting listening to um, all those that have gone before. Um, yeah, like you said, I've got an interest or an association with three different sports. So, um, and quite different, you know, quite con contrasting, especially hockey, which we know is um, here in Ireland anyway, when you talk about gender equality, um, we're, we're on the upside of that. So, the uh, the participation levels in, in hockey is, is skewed 65 to 35 in favor of, of, of women's participation. Um, but then, you know, on the other side of, of my association with motorsport, um, you're looking at 5% um, of females uh, currently hold licenses in Ireland. So a huge gap there in, in gender inequality or gender balance um, for uh, female representation in, in motorsport. And I suppose that's where um, Formula Female comes in. You know, that was set up in 2018 to try and increase the representation of females in, in motorsport and, and the motor industry in general. Um, if that's, you know, engineering, uh, technicians, mechanics, anything um, that's, that, that, that there involves motorsport or, or the motor industry. Um, so, you know, if you talk about motorsport, traditionally, yes, it's a male dominated sport. Um, I know that, that women's uh, traditional role in motorsport was, was seen to be grid girls, which I know they've got rid of uh, in the last few years. Um, and it's only now that we're starting to see actually the, the, the attributes that women have in motorsport. So like their skills um, and their, the different roles that they hold uh, within the sport itself, which is, is, is great to see. Um, and I think that, you know, you talk about a, a progressive environment for, for women's sports. And I think that motorsport is definitely trying to, to close that gender gap uh, a lot by different initiatives that have been brought out. Um, they've just launched the W Series last year, which is a, it's a women only series. And although there was a little bit of controversy over that, the fact that you're trying to segregate women, um, I think that it, it, has, it has brought so much opportunity for all those female drivers currently in the W Series, but also for any young girls that are aspiring to get to the next level, that the W Series is now a potential uh, stepping stone for them to, to, to get to. So I think that introducing that was certainly um, a good initiative. Um, and since then, you know, here in Ireland with my own initiative, the Go Girls Karting Initiative, um, we're, trying to make, we're trying to make the sport more accessible. So trying to open it up make um make it, uh, more young girls aware that this is a sport that you can participate in that it is for girls um and try and like highlight the, the the visibility of role models i think that role models are hugely important in in um in increasing the number of girls that that take up a sport or even become aware of a sport that it's something for them that they can can be involved in um and you know aside from the the go girls initiative there's also a, an Irish motorsports team now called CJJ Motorsports, who's, you know, they're trying to give young drivers and young engineers and, and mechanics uh, a future in the sport. So, you know, giving them an opportunity to progress and um, to reach their abilities, their um, potential on the world stage. And it doesn't just have to be Formula One. I think sometimes um, people see Formula One as the ultimate goal where it, it doesn't have to be. There's so many different forms of motorsport um, and there's so many different careers involved in it and so many different paths that you can go down that actually if you if you open up all those other opportunities it makes it more accessible for these people to, to potentially create a career for themselves whether it's it through participation as, as a driver or you know as an engineer or a mechanic so having CJJ Motorsports in in Ireland now is really going to make uh, a change and you know listening to Kleena talking about, you know, the pace of change. Um, it's, it's about time that we, we, start, we, we are trying to make change, but it's not just about sort of one-off event or, or you know, a, a one-year sort of initiative. It's about long-term planning. And I think that CJJ Motorsports is, is looking to, 
to have this long term goal to, to, to feed Irish drivers, Irish mechanics, engineers through a system that, you know, ultimately that uh, in, in a few years you'll see real change uh, in the motorsport industry here in Ireland. And, and for girls and boys, there's no, um, there's no inequality in, in the CJJ motorsports team. They just signed Nicole Drought this year and she's been racing in the um, UK Brick Car Endurance Championship. And she, and she just won her first race uh, about two weeks ago. And the other driver they have is James Rowe, who's competing in the Formula Regional Americas in the US. So it's great to have an Irish team. Motorsport is obviously um, one of the, the lower um, well-known sports, shall we say, in Ireland. But there's things happening now to try and uh, increase the profile of the sport and, and do it in a fair way when you talk about uh, gender balance. So that's pretty much my experience of uh, inequality um, or gender balance um, and portrayal. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I know it, it absolutely fascinating insight. And thanks for that, Nikki. I know my own experience of motorsport is that theoretically, of course, there's no, um, it is a level playing field for women, but it's anything but, and that the way that women are portrayed in the sport is uh, antediluvian in many ways, that it's uh, so much a uh, discussion around uh, women's looks that are uh, never mentioned in terms of men and like, the sort of brands that they might attract in terms of sponsorship. It's all about cosmetics for women and anything you like, you know, oil companies, etc., for for men. And so that's, uh, and I was one who didn't believe that the W Series last year was a good idea and when I saw it come out I thought in actual fact I was wrong it actually what did help to uh, to just uh, divert and sort of uh, you know put some attention on women's motor racing in, in the right way um, so uh, great thanks very much Nikki we might even talk about hockey a little bit later on as well um, we're also joined by Deirdre Carberry as uh, I've mentioned and Deirdre we're well, very welcome back thanks for taking the time out once more we've uh, already been inspired by your thoughts on leadership how can we bring that experience to bear on assessing and changing norms around gender portrayal. Thank you Declan and uh, delighted to be here again and um, what I love actually about this this uh, session is that it is really tying together all the elements um, that we've spoken uh, about previously and I guess when I reflect back at my own um, my own career choice at the age of you know 16 17 and um, going into the military I very much chose a, a career or a life that was um, maybe atypical of the life um, society is telling girls that we'd be, we should be aspiring to be. Um, a life centered um, on, you know, how women look, how girls look, what we wear, and where girls' value is very, very much measured in terms of, um, is not measured in terms of our in intellect or compassion or our humanity or our bravery or our courage, um, but very much on maybe more if I can say shallow or, or vacuous ideals. Um, and the military was offering me something that was very different to that. And looking back at, at why I still chose to pursue that route, it very much had to do with my own um, family situation, dynamic. Um, I had a mom and dad who probably didn't realize it, but they brought up my brothers and I in a very nearly gender neutral way where um, we didn't have different expectations uh, placed on us. And we were very much allowed to fulfill our our own individual potentials. Um, and I guess we have to say it, and, and we've, we've heard from incredible speakers here today who've articulated it much better than me, but we live in a world that cares more about the insides of men and the outside of women. Um, as a society, we do seem to be obsessed with how women look. And this sports um, and, and, and sports media um, cannot be, you know, exempt from this. We are all products of the societies that, that we're formed by and that we live in. Um, and I think a few common thematic areas have very much come through uh, throughout these sessions and they are biases, uh, stereotypes, traditional associations around um, masculinity, femininity, um, idealized versions of men and women. And um, I think it's interesting as well. One of, one of my areas that I focus in on as a gender and human security advisor um, and something that's quite, um, uh, quite a, a serious vulnerability in terms of, of military security and conflict settings is uh, how we as society perceive, um, perceive men and women and therefore perceive the threat posed by men and women. Um, and a lot of work I do is around challenging traditional gender norms and, and people's unconscious biases. Um, because if we don't, um, we're really limiting ourselves as well um, and, you know, not identifying women as 
as say terrorists, as um, perpetrators of, of sexual violence. We're not seeing um, men as, as victims or survivors uh, of sexual violence, men as uh, women's rights activists, human rights activists. Um, and this is really important for us. And I, I saw quite clearly when I was serving in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where I was very much challenged in terms of, of my own biases and unconscious biases. And me thinking that I was, you know, so, so well informed um, that, you know, I wasn't influenced by media or I haven't been influenced by images. In fact, I, I was very much a product um, of the society um, that I was born into. Um, and, you know, I saw, I saw rebel leaders that, that you know, were women. Um, I saw um, uh, women who were um, showing incredible feats of, of physical, um, of physicality as well in, the, in their day-to-day -day existence um, as well. And um, it, it really emphasized to me that, you know, we're not our reproductive organs. We are all individuals with our own minds, our own personalities, our own strengths, weaknesses, passions, and um, very much those traditional stereotypical gender norms are, are just constraining our, our own ideas as well. And um, the media plays a very powerful role in this and imagery and storytelling are hugely powerful tools. Um, they permeate every aspect of our lives as well and really shape our perceptions and shape the way we see the world and can serve as really powerful tools of propaganda as well. Um, and I, I think as well, um, if I was to just kind of end on, on from my own experience and, and working with, um, working in conflict settings and working in the security uh, sector, um, knowing that babies from the age of six can recognize corporate logos and that society is shaping and influence babies from the second they're born. And even some cases we have those gender reveal parties even before they're born. Um, I, I would say as media or indeed definitely as consumers of media, um, but you know, PR, journalists, researchers, filmmakers, writers, don't underestimate the power that, that you have in discouraging um, tomorrow's athletes. And also on the flip side, recognize the power you hold to inform, educate, and represent the reality um, of women's diverse roles. And it's critical that you know that, that power is wielded responsibly and with very much um, a gender equality focus to the forefront. Um, and it may be necessary to, you know, to establish uh, independent checks and balances and, and to have a critical eye um, over those stories we're telling or those images that we're putting out there. Um, as you know, they, they, they really are so, so formative. Um, and I, I just feel fortunate, um, you know, looking at the military and never seeing a, a woman in uniform, um, only having, you know, uh, soldiers um, depicted as, as male, strong, tall, um, mostly uh, men in, um, in film, in media, um, always been, you know, reinforced to me at every stage that, that my career choice was atypical. I just feel fortunate that I, I had that family dynamic that I was able to overcome that. But unfortunately, you know, many people don't um, have those kind of influences in their lives. So, you know, media really is playing that, that critical role in, in shaping society. Fascinating stuff. Um, uh, Deirdre, or Kalina Foley, Deirdre mentions imagery and storytelling and just how important that is. Um, a long and storied career in, in, sport, in uh, sports journalism. You must have been one of the only women out there at the time, and there aren't so many now. I mean, how has it changed and what needs to change now in your experience of the work? Well, I, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's like everything else. I think if, you, if you're a minority gender in any job, you just get in there, you get, you get to do the job. And very often sometimes, you know, you might have to do that old thing, you know, of, of you know, doing twice as much work to, produce, to, to show that you're half as good if there are gender stereotypes there and inequalities there. But I'm really encouraged by the fact that, you know, we have some really young, new, good sports writers in the country, Emma Duffy and Sinead Farrell with the 42 are really good. And I think also, um, you know, We've seen we've seen the growth in broadcast media of women, and I also think that those women in those positions influence the people around them. You know, and I see also, you know, just a new generation of journalists. Really, you know, the old stereotypes, you know, the old that old stereotypical image of the male sports editor, you know, uh, with the picture of the woman in the bikini behind him, that's gone now. You know, and and I just think the media has changed, the world has changed in in regard to gender and inequality. I just think it's 
you know, we just have to keep pushing it on. And I'm really interested. Um, uh, Heather Boyle told me, the comms person from the IOC, that actually the IOC um, are now positively discriminating in terms of Olympic accreditations. So that they are, there's a possibility that they will give accreditations to female sports journalists, you know, uh, in, to, to bump up the numbers. And there, there's an example of organizations taking it on and positively discriminating. I'm really interested in, in um, the, the W series because I thought that was really interesting what Nikki was saying about that because I was really interested again. And it was a very similar thing happened. They gave a weight allowance to jockey, to female jockeys in France and there was a big complained about it but actually it seemed to have worked very well so sometimes we need forms of positive discrimination whether it's in sport or whether it's in the media i think they're starting to make a difference but progress progress sometimes can feel frustratingly slow is it, is it currently tougher for a woman to get a job as a sports journalist or in the sports media than for a man no i don't believe that at all i don't i don't think it makes absolutely a blind bit of difference you just got to have to go in and show that you can do the job and i'm sure clean o'leary would would say the same thing yeah, I, I'd agree with that, Lena. Um, I suppose the one thing that I would say is that um, a lot of women um, maybe are not going for the jobs. And I think that's where we have a responsibility as well in looking at our job adverts, because, you know, an awful lot of the time when you write up a job advert, it can read, um, it's like it's like editorial um, judgment, you know, it's very male. Um, if you, like when you're, you would maybe prevent yourself from going for a job. And I, and I had this recently, I met this woman who's a brilliant sports journalist. And I asked her, did she go for a job in RT for, for the recent um, advert? And she said that she didn't think she was qualified enough. And, and I couldn't believe it because she's a brilliant journalist. And, and I think it's just that sometimes when you read a job ad, and, and, and I mentioned this as well, and I know that our HR department are looking at the language that's in it, but you can read GAA, you know, having a good knowledge of GAA soccer and rugby. You look at that and you think men's sport. You don't think women's sport because that's what you're used to. And I think just by putting in a line to saying, you know, having a knowledge of women's sport is, is a positive. I think that actually will turn women looking at it and say, well, I've got, they're, they're looking for me here or they or you know, so I think that we need to look at how we're writing job ads and how do we get out there and encourage women to apply for these jobs and tell them that, yes, you, you are every bit as qualified. And in actual fact, we're trying to address the inequalities that are there at the moment. And we'd love you to go for the job interview. Because like I had that myself where I put a job up a number of years ago for a sports set sub Editor, and we got 78 applicants, and only two were women. And we really, we really did want to engage a woman in that role, but but it was very difficult, you know. So it's just, I think, job adverts and language around that is really, really important to try and 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 address it. And we we are a minority as well, Declan. Like more men are interested in sports than women. That's the fact of life, you know. Every all statistics show that. Um, so you know you can't create journalists if the women aren't going for the jobs. Lena's right. But I've never come across um, any kind of discrimination. You do, I think, probably initially, in particular with with an older generation, you had to really, really prove yourself, um, perhaps more than a man. But otherwise, no, I don't see any absolutely any barrier to women becoming sports journalists in any area. And Clean O'Leary, you mentioned um, targets and regular monitoring and, and you know, how you've introduced them in RT. Have you experienced any pushback in that? I mean, at the beginning of your presentation, you said nobody sees themselves as, as having any sort of uh, gender equality bias, uh, but then only 4% of coverage. Do you, do you find that it's, it's, you're pushing against traditional, um, which may be male orientated uh, sports events, you're, you're trying to fight to get them reduced and, and to increase maybe women's, uh, women's coverage? Is there a pushback? Uh, yeah, there's challenges. There's absolutely challenges because like, um, you know, and it's the same when, like, it's just when you're like, that's why I think that targets are really, really important because, because if you're suggesting uh, ways to bring women's sport in, sometimes you're displacing men's sport and it can be really challenging because the men's sport is, 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 is performing really, really well. And also like you look at the Sunday game, for example, like, uh, you know, you might have 20 um, men's games on over the weekend and, and you don't want to go longer than a, a two hour program. And so where, how do we fit in uh, Camogie and ladies football into it? You know, so, so you do have challenges like that. Um, you have challenges 
um, in, in, in kind of ways where I said earlier that, like, you know, you only have a certain amount of resources. So, you know, where are you going to put the resources into? Um, you'd have challenges and, and also airtime. So th there are a lot of challenges. There's, like, we had a lot of challenges with COVID, I suppose, because we set, set ourselves a 20% target on women's sport for this year in television. And uh, we're at 14% till the end of June. And, um, you know, the Olympics and the Paralympics were going to be 50-50. And that was really going to help to, to increase our women's sports coverage. And over the, uh, you know, April, May, June, we had to delve back into the archives. And it, you know, it made us see as well that, uh, that, you know, it's dominated by men's sport, particularly men's team sports. Um, and both the fact that the targets were there meant that we looked at, you know, the, the this archive series and said, well, we ha we have to put women's sport into it. Whereas, and and wanted to, but you know, if the target wasn't there, it wouldn't have been it, we wouldn't have been aware of the drive to try and address uh, those. So I, I really think targets there are really important to try and address it. Yeah, Nikki, you've uh, you took part in that extraordinary uh, women's qualifier in in Donnybrook. We all got wet that evening, and it was uh, <laughs> nail biting stuff. Thanks very much for what you did to my heart. But um, you mentioned sixty five percent participation, uh, female participation in hockey. And is there a sense, perhaps, that women do okay in hockey, and actually men need a bit of a boost in that particular sport? Yeah, I think that's um, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier on is the fact that in in hockey you know we are well represented um in, in terms of participation um female to male um and i think it's also noticeable that um after the back of the world cup the women's team is on an upward you know trajectory and there's there's so much talk around the women's team um but and when the men made it to the the olympics say four years ago did they receive maybe the same sort of uh, attention and, and media coverage that we are pro probably going to get in the run up to Tokyo next year. So, yeah, I think it's um, maybe it's to do with the fact that we did so well in the World Cup and everything that we've achieved. Everyone, the spotlight's sort of on us, and we've you know we've kind of drawn in so many fans, and and people are really eager to kind of follow uh, women's hockey. Um, and maybe the men's team didn't have that sort of sensation before the Olympics that kind of um, put the spotlight on them as much. So. Yeah, I think there is maybe a slight inequality there um, in terms of the men's side rather than the women's side when it comes to hockey. Declan, I think there's a really interesting um, interesting comparison there. Like it, It's so true, everything that Nikki says. But what really interested me about people's reaction to the, to the women's hockey team and their success at the World Cup was that it was not viewed through this comparative prism. There was nobody saying, oh, they're slower than the men. They're not as, they don't score as many goals. They're not as fit because it's um, technically, you know, we would describe it as, I suppose, in, in the sportsman's as a minority sport. Most people have not got a great knowledge of men's hockey. So they didn't view women's hockey against that and compare them. They just went, oh my God, they're amazing. Their skill is incredible. They're unbelievably fit and they've got nerves of tungsten. Who can do that? And they're World Cup, you know, runners up. So they weren't viewed through a male prism at all. And I think that's a really interesting thing. And it's interesting about the portrayal of sport and it's what female athletes, um, particularly in team sports, I don't think in every sport, particularly in team sports, they get compared and they get, and, and there's absolutely no reason for it. They're, they're, you know, why would we compare? There's no reason to compare. I I would say you never get people standing up at a hundred at, at an athletics event when the women's hundred meters comes on and going into the bar they don't see them as any less than the men's hundred meter runners so there's not that comparative thing going on um, so that i think that was one of the brilliant things about um nikki's team's success and where they'll go next and i think that's uh, the fact that they got so much coverage i don't think it was down to the fact that they were women it was the circumstances what had gone before and what they did on the biggest occasion of their lives that was what garnered the respect yeah respect you indeed um uh, it was a great evening and it has been a great afternoon hasn't it can i just ask the uh, the panelists for their final takeaway point uh, the 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 summing up point or what's our what's the the important kernel of uh, of nugget of knowledge that you'd uh, like to present to us so maybe clean uh, clean uh, foley you go first um, I suppose I, I think things are changing. Things are positive. The 20 by 20 movement has been very interesting in somebody going in, taking an initiative that wasn't actually involved in the media business, but looking for partnerships. I think that's really interesting. I think the message for me is we all need to do better. Journalists need to do better. Sports bodies need to do better. And the suffragettes motto always was deeds, not words.
And uh, Clean O'Leary, what's your your takeaway point? Um, like, there's been very little public discourse on the in issue of gender inequality in sport in Ireland. Um, I think these webinars have been fantastic, and I congratulate and thank the the OFI for them. Um, what, like, you know, when you're looking for education about gender equality, you go to UNESCO, UN, and all the rest. But then we go to the UK and US for their Women Foundation data. Like, and and actually, as I said, like the US are 53, 53rd in the world, and the UK are 21st. We're seventh. Like, so so an awful lot of the data that they're producing is not relevant for us. And I'm just, I think, for me, it's just to keep the topic of gender equality alive in Irish sport. Like we should be talking about it. Everyone should be talking about it as an important topic. Um, it, it matters, like as I mentioned about the OBS mentioning at the World Broadcasters meeting, it matters hugely when someone comes in to our table and talks about uh, uh, gender equality and they're, they're female athletes. And that has happened. And, um, you know, where one uh, team sport um, a CEO came in and spoke, and where we thought he was going to talk about women's sport, he spoke about actually the importance of these female athletes and exposure for them. And like, you know, also I think when you raise it as a topic, and I raised it with a race course uh, trainer uh, or a race course um, uh, a CEO recently to say that, like, you know, when we started to actually count the time, I would just went 33% um, was how much our uh, women's sport was aside in horse racing. In our, when we looked at our horse racing coverage, it was between 8 and 14% actually, it was much less. And so when I raised it um, with the CEO of the race course, he said, actually, you know, that's really important. And this is these are the things that we're aiming to do. And he already had ideas and ways that maybe we could collaborate on um, women only races or whatever it was. It was a number of different things. So I think that, uh, that it's really important that people see uh, that, that you raise it and talk about it. Because I think from that kind of awareness, then we will get uh, positive actions will evolve. So it's really to keep the topic of gender equality alive in, in, in our sport. Very good. And uh, Nikki, what's your takeaway point? I think it's pretty similar to uh, Kleena and, and Kleena. I think, um, you know, the the pace of change is something that stuck with me from from what Kleena said earlier. And I think that in order to accelerate that that change, it, we do need more long term planning and, and more campaigns around gender balance, and gender equality and to keep that movement going. You know, it, we are progressing, but can we progress a little bit more? And I think the more that everyone does, not just in a sporting um field but also in the in the workplace as well you know for example i just became brand ambassador there for msl grange motors uh who specifically have set targets to increase their female representation and to close their their gender balance gap within the company um, and i think that was really positive to hear that it's something outside of the sporting world that there's you know you're associated with companies who are genuinely trying to close the gender gender gap um everywhere um, and so i think the more that we can do that, the more, uh, the quicker we can we can close the gap. Very good. And uh, Deirdre, maybe you'd uh, give us a final summing up. Yeah, um, I think for me, it's that um, gender equality is is everyone's business. Um, and really, if we are to to make the progress that that we all want, um, to progress all the issues that have been discussed over the past number of weeks, um, really the key thing to do now is is to take action, um, tangible, uh, measurable, data driven actions, um, and that will that will keep the um, keep the progress and keep um, keep the progress monitored as well, which I think is hugely important. Well, thanks for that. Some wonderful uh, insights there. Now I'd like to call on Aideen Keane from Circle K, partner with the Olympic Federation of Ireland in support of Team Ireland for Tokyo, who will speak about gender balance and the relationship between Circle K and Team Ireland. And Aideen, thanks for joining us. Thank you, uh, Declan. Um, it's been a great, it's been a fascinating talk to listen to so far. And thank you to the OFI for having me here. Um, my name is Aideen and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Circle K Ireland. Um, with Circle K being the largest four-court retailer in Ireland with over 2,000 employees locally and 130,000 globally, um, gender equality is really firmly on the agenda and it's something we see ourselves as having a really strong responsibility for. Um, 
both internally, but also how we portray ourselves through our advertising as well and our, and our sponsorships. Um, our global CEO has actually signed the CEO Action Pledge, which outlines a specific set of actions to cultivate an environment supportive of diversity and inclusion. A global women's council has been set up this year who have set up unconscious bias training. I actually only joined the company a few months ago and the first thing I was asked to do was complete an unconscious bias training course, which I was really impressed by. I've never seen that in a, another company that I've been part of. Um, and there's work groups that are set up across the globe, one of which I've signed up to, uh, where employers can get involved and push for change in diversity and inclusion where, it's, where they see it's needed. So I see kind of Circle Care are taking, they recognise that they always will always need to do better, um, but they're taking some really kind of serious action in the last six months or so on to that direction. When we were looking at sponsorship in, in Ireland, um, the area of sports was looked at really, really closely. And what's really evident, actually, and you, when you look at it, you really see it, is that it's very male dominated across rugby and GAA. And I'd like to you know, call it Lidl for actually doing a really good job on the women's GAA side of things. But in general, it's quite male dominated. So we wanted a partnership, a sports partnership that communities are involved with, but also that our customers can relate to across all walks of life. Um, and as Andrea mentioned earlier, with the Olympics, you know, a medal winner is a medal winner, regardless of gender. So we thought it was a really good fit for us. Um, and what Deirdre had highlighted earlier then is, is what she said, is that we have us as a company and as a sponsor, we have a serious responsibility to keep pushing the, the gender equality agenda in all our communications throughout the sponsorship. Um, Somebody on this, this talk um, a few weeks back actually mentioned that the goal isn't to be treated equally, it's the state of being equal. And I found that absolutely so interesting and I took so much from that and it's a way I hadn't thought about this before. So forums like this are so important for companies and representative of companies like this to attend and examine their own position and to see what needs to be done. But what's equally important are the actions taken and that an environment is fostered that supports women and mothers in the workplace, but also how they're portrayed in sponsorships and advertising. Um, and just to finish really quickly, Circle Care are extremely proud to be here for the Irish athletes and we can't wait to see what's to come. So thank you. And thanks for that, uh, Aideen. Well, it's been a superbly engaging afternoon. I think you'll agree. Uh, just time to thank our panellists, uh, Cleena Foley, Cleena O'Leary, Nikki Daly and Deirdre Carberry. Also, uh, Andrea Bland, Aideen Keane and all involved uh, today, including Sarah Keane, Heather Boyle, Linda O'Reilly, Mary Maguire and Georgie Francis and all who've uh, helped to make this series such a success. I'd like to call now on OFI CEO Peter Sherrard for a final message to close the session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kleena, Kleena, Nikki, uh, and Declan and Deirdre for today's fascinating discussion and insights. Look, I, I took a number of things out of today's discussion. It was really, really good. Um, first of all, we have to challenge our biases. Uh, we have to challenge the hierarchies. And as Kleena mentioned, unpick history. Uh, don't just you know sit back and say, well, that's tradition. You know, We all have a duty to say uh, we have to make change and we need to make this happen. From an administrator's point of view, I think it's really important as well in a, from a sports context not to fall down the commercial revenues rabbit hole. There's a big duty on our, on our side to restore equality because it didn't start off equal. And we actually have to take affirmative action to, to bring that about. The bottom line from all of the sessions, and I think they've been really, really good from the point of view of bringing a focus to the area of gender equality, is that gender equality will make us stronger we saw that through the sessions and coaching. We saw that through leadership, governance, and today's portrayal session. Not simply stronger, but better, smarter, more representative, more dynamic, uh, better decision makers, more responsive. So that can't be ignored if, from any point of view, from a business point of view, from a sports point of view. And we, as administrators, and a lot of the people listening today, the women and men who are tuned in, in leadership positions, can make that change and we need to bring it about. So uh, what I'd like to, to leave it with is that after these sessions we've had fascinating insights from our speakers and all of them have, have given a duty, uh, an action that we can take home and focus on. And I'd like to think that over the next week or two each of us listening to today and in all of the other sessions will actually try and produce tangible actions out of it as cleaner uh, Foley said, you know, it's not about the words, it's about the deeds. We have a duty to do it and we can do it and we can do it in all of our spheres. So I'd like to thank uh, the Sport Ireland Women in Sport Initiative. I'd like to thank our sponsors. I'd like to thank uh, Linda and Heather and Mary for the Trojan work in bringing this about. And I'd like to think that together 
all of the people, and there's a great number of people who we can't see in the sessions here, but there's been, you know, four or 500 people over the course of all of the different sessions can make a real change. So let's bring about a real legacy and let's move this agenda higher up because it's going to make us all stronger. Thank you.